Hello, and welcome to the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US, a podcast in which we explore the mind bending world of global supply chain, covering topics such as automation, innovation, unique identity, and more. I'm your co host, Reed. And I'm Liz. And welcome to the show. Reed, how are you? I'm a little scared, actually. Yeah. Liz. Yeah. So, right Spooky I'm- time out there. It's scary times and coming off of the holiday weekend of Halloween, we're going to just kind of extend the scariness with all things supply chain. I mean, we're living in this weird, scary, I guess, supply chain world where my kids talk about supply chain, not just because they're worried about like, you know, the holidays coming up, but you know, what's going on with all of this different things and stuff like ice cream. That isn't at the isn't at the grocery store anymore, and you know, fruit drinks. So we're just gonna spend a couple minutes talking about what the supply chain is and how it is now and why, because the supply chain has existed forever, but right now we're just in this mess of the perfect storm. I think maybe started with the pandemic, but really has spiraled out of control. I think. Yeah, I mean today, folks and. We're just going to talk about scary supply chain stories and just kind of play off of the Halloween theme that's uh, just beyond us or behind us now here. Um, But it is amazing to me, Liz, that no matter where you go today, everyone's talking about supply chain. Like it's front page news. It's of everyone's topic. And to your point, when children are talking about supply chain, I think that's right next to like, you know, four-year-olds talking about calculus, right? Like you just don't do it. Like they don't do it. Like what, what, oh, well, you know, supply chain, all this stuff. But I, you know, we were talking, we've been talking, lots of things going on, um, lots of different conversations, but the pandemic has definitely woken a lot of us up to the complexities of our supply chains and that we've been so focused on efficiencies, we lost sight of resiliency. I, I think that's kind of the safest to say from from a, from a macro standpoint. I mean, companies were able to um, get product in and out of distribution centers, but then a pandemic hits and you don't have enough supply to supply the demand. And they don't necessarily know where the products are in a timely manner. And it just like built and built and built. And who knew that we would need so much hand sanitizer and toilet paper for whatever reason. Um, And then the shifts of we're at home, we're not going to the stadiums and the restaurants and all of the needs evolved. And it was this new thing. We never had to face that before. Yeah. And I think you've brought this up many times before. Our supply chains really aren't linear anymore, right? They're more web. Uh, yeah. You're, you're laughing. What are you laughing? Uh, so, so, you know, when I do the GS1 US kind of 101 background, there's a slide. And if any of you have seen them, you'll know it. So for, it goes from left to right, from a manufacturer to either a patient in the hospitals or, or somebody in a restaurant or a grocery store. And, it, and it's linear because that's how that's how it's shown. But they're not linear. There are these webs of interactions and transactions between trading partners up and down the supply chain. And when you start layering packaging into it and uh, things like, you know, carbon dioxide and all those raw materials, it, it's just this web. And that's when we start talking from a standards perspective of if you're identifying products and places and capturing that information, it can improve the ability to make that web of a supply chain. It'll never be linear, but maybe we can understand it in a more linear way so that we can more easily get to that information when something odd like a pandemic or a natural disaster or you know a local issue, a trucking issue. That doesn't have to be a pandemic, but a, a, an you issue. You mean a, a boat stuck in the Suez Canal? A boat stuck in the Suez Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I really do feel like it's it's this perfect storm. We've been talking a lot with a lot of different people and, and having some, we, we conduct executive exchange forums to bring the brightest together and, and, and share ideas. But the pandemic forced us globally to stay home. I and mean, we all saw the news and, you know, what's happening here and there and everywhere around the world. And it forced us all to stay home. Yes, we had... Um, you know, required workers and thank God for grocery mm-hmm. workers and ship uh, truckers and shipping and all those things. But even some of those still had to stay home or quit their jobs or change jobs and, and do different things. It wasn't a perfect environment. So first we're, we're forced to stay home um, for safety, right? Um, and, and for good reason. But then as we're home, we, we, we still need goods. And, and then there's the, what I call the social media impact, which is panic, right? It's panic buying kicks in, like, there's no toilet paper. Did you see the shelves? And it's like, what one picture goes wild. And, you know, Liz and I both live in the South. I live in North Carolina and she lives in Georgia. And, you know, I'm from the Northeast originally, 40 years plus up there. And it just amazes me how in North Carolina, like, we're, you know, outside of the Blue Ridge Mountains, where we do get lots of snow and there's ski slopes, believe it or not. But in your regular, let's just say Charlotte, city of Charlotte, we'd be lucky to get like one inch of snow a year. Um, but when that snowstorm comes and the weatherman, weather person predicts, hey, this is what's going to happen. Whew, we all go panic buying. You run to the store and I don't know why it is. We all grab you know, milk and bread and all things that, you know, me as an older individual is told not to eat anymore. Um, but it just, it just, you know, we're just trying to make some light joke of this, but it's amazing how the panic buying happens. And I think that nowadays because of social media, it is amplified tenfold plus. Um, and, and it just amazes me. I mean, the supply chain issues that are happening now, there's always been this supply chain, right? Um, of getting goods from somewhere to another place. And there's been issues historically. There's been recalls and there's been demand issues. Um, There's been oil tankers stuck in the Suez Canal, right? Um, Yeah, in in 2004 for uh, the PlayStation, um, they they actually hired um, Russian aircrafts to get goods off the boat to do and it was still late for the holidays in that so so like you said that was in 2004 that that's not today no and and i think because now one with the pandemic but two like you said social media and it's all over the news and you know for holiday shopping you better order now in october or november and make sure that you're getting these things early and i think it's this awareness of um, the issues that are happening, but also could be happening. And then you have a more, um, more demand, different demand, more panic, different panic. And it, it just is, is this kind of snowball. Yeah. And you don't, I mean, who knows what's going to be, be next that we're going yeah. to be to be seeing. Yeah. So, so, you know, we saw the panic buying and then there was a phrase out there, revenge spending, which is a scary word just to kind of, you know, or term just to say revenge spending, but folks had pent up money. They weren't going on vacations. They, they wanted to do improvements around the house. So, you know, they were getting all these pools and bicycles and it it, it blew my mind because, you know, my, I have hobbies just like everyone, but I like to mountain bike ride and I like to um, do enduro riding with my motorcycle and my sons and my daughter. We, we go when we go to these places, you know, that, you know, have regular members there and you're, you're, you're going to these mountain bike parks or you're going to like the motocross park and we're riding dirt bikes for the weekend. And you always have your typical folks. But now during the pandemic, it was like, oh my gosh, it was a traffic jam on the mountain bike trails because everyone's there. And then when you went to the motocross park, you would have thought that they were having a national event um, and all the the pros from around the world were there because it was no one had nowhere else to go. So like it was happening and then you had the boredom set in. So I'm just going to buy for boredom. I do want to point out this though, and I know we've talked about it on, on a couple of episodes, but if the pandemic would have happened 
in the 80s, I think that the world would have been forced into a depression because we're closing things and, and doing that. But because of the internet and where we are, I think it really survived and, and in some cases thrived um, and, and developed some new innovative things. But fundamentally, we still have this laggard problem, which is people were forced to go home. So some manufacturing plants were closed, right? I mean, living in North Carolina, they make a lot of furniture uh, here. Well, they could make the furniture, but they couldn't get the, the, the foam to put into the furniture. So waiting, that causes another one to wait. And then they have to put people on, you know, uh, furloughs. And so, so it has this cascading compounding effect. And then, as you said, we're in this web. So like, we had to start to redirect um, goods and materials to hospitals. Uh, distilleries are now making hand sanitizer and, and, and doing different things. Um, so it the bottlenecks, because of the web effect, started to happen at each step of the supply chain. So we had labor, and then people have to stay home, and some folks, you know, were scared. So certain truck drivers just I have to pull myself out of that environment. And so we don't have it. And then you have ships that can't get into ports because the port they're trying to get into has certain laws about vaccinated, non-vaccinated testing, non-testing and all this other stuff. Um, and then, you know, you have your railroads and your ports and then containers, container ships. Well, here come all the containers full of the goods. <laughs> We don't have enough people to unload them. We unload them, but we don't have enough goods to go back in them to send them back to be reused. So then new containers have to be manufactured. And, but there's, it, it's, it's this circular web. Like it's kind of like that old design, uh, you know, with the atoms and electrons and they're going in all different directions. That's how I kind of feel the, the supply chain is. It's not truly linear. It's linear for a use case. It, yes, it's, it's not linear. linear in practice. Exactly, and and when you said you know people were going home, not only would you know from a transportation standpoint, but people went home, and for instance, most people now I don't know if you have a kegerator at your house, but most people don't have kegs of beer at their house, so you had you know this change of how people were consuming beer right? It, they weren't going to the bars anymore. They weren't going to restaurants and having draft beer. They were getting bottles. So there, you couldn't get enough bottles to put the beer in. Same with, you know, with fountain drinks. They weren't, there wasn't enough cans to get in the soda. And it's just like all of these, this, you're right, this atom, this bouncing of issues. There wasn't one that was like this magic bullet that was going to fix it. Um, I think that there was a bunch of silver linings and, and now that we're kind of at the maybe hopefully three quarter, I don't know what that's called in football, but third, whatever, a line, third quarter. third quarter, whatever. I'm trying to use a sports analogy. Um, <laughs> but I, love it. I think that, you know, we've learned a lot and, and there are ways hopefully that the supply chain can be more efficient and maybe by learning, oh my gosh, maybe this efficiency, it's great to be efficient, but we have got to put enough whatever in the supply chain, enough space so that when things happen, we have time to make adjustments through that. Um, but there, there definitely have been learnings and, and hopefully hindsight is maybe not 2020, but close to it. Well, I think you bring up a great point because when we look back at history and we see some like if, if you just, you know, do a search on the Internet for uh, scary supply chain stories, I mean, everything will come up. Um, I think that the difference is, is that today everyone's dealing with it at the same time. It's not like, oh, it's really too bad for X, Y, Z company that they had a snafu in their supply chain. Good for us. We're going to keep moving along, you know, and, and, and driving through some things. But like in 1995, Apple had a huge supply chain issue during the holiday seasons with a misforecast that they had. Right. Um, and I think that the, the article here um, talked about, and this is 1995, Apple severely under forecast for the demand for their new Power Mac PCs. Two years prior, they overestimated 
and had execs um, and had excess inventory in their PowerBook laptops. So to avoid that mistake, forecasters extremely um, under um, prepared this time, and the demand was much higher for a different reason. It was a different time, different involvement. I mean, 1995 email was just really starting to kick in. You know, everyone wanted that. You've got mail, right? They wanted that uh, type of thing. Yeah, Liz, I know you you, you remember that as well. Yeah. Um, but so at, at that point, they had a one billion dollars in under fulfilled orders. One billion dollars in under fulfilled orders. So who's feeling good about this? Probably all their competitors. At that point, it would have been like IBM and Dell and and some of these other groups. So it just affected one group. I think the silver lining here for the pandemic is it's affecting us all, us all equally. And it's one thing I really like about GS1 is that we're here for industry, right? We're a standards body, but we're here for industry. So we're, we're here to kind of like help lift all the folks in industry and not just one or the other. Um, and, you know, after being in business in, in in different sectors for, for quite some time and now doing this type of work and working with companies and pulling groups together. It's a different type of satisfaction, you know, working with them, but having this now, I think it's nice to see companies come together and be like, Whoa, we were really focused on squeezing the blood out of the stone of the supply chain to, to get as much as we can out of it. And we missed resiliency. And now everyone's starting to realize, you don't have efficiency without resiliency because you, you mentioned it before natural disasters, a hurricane, right? Um, unfortunately I've been through two and they are not fun tornadoes. Thankfully I haven't been affected by any of them, but I've had friends and it's, it's devastating floods, all the natural disasters that happen. But the unique thing is, is that they happen to a region or an area. So others can lean in and, and cover for that. But when this pandemic happens globally, it affected us all the same way. So it, it really gave us all great pause to sit back and think on for a bit. And I think some grace too. So when, when these things happen, whether it's a shortage of whatever, ice cream, you have a little bit more grace than we did right. before as a society to be okay with that. You also have, you're always going to have those bad actors, right? Remember um, you had the hand sanitizers last year that weren't maybe really hand sanitizers, but like you're as a community, I think we all have gr a little bit more grace now and awareness of how supply chains can work. Um, and it's actually really cool because the supply chain in and of itself is this amazing thing that happens outside of our houses every single day whether it's trains that you're annoyed, right? When you, you don't make the tracks or the big old trucks on the highway that you're scared to pass. Um, but the supply chain just surrounds us every single day. And it really got messed up. Um, but I think we appreciate it differently now. I think we absolutely appreciate it differently now. Uh, I think that we're coming together, you know, like, uh, coming together to talk more about it openly and not have it as feel so much of a competitive advantage. Uh, I'm seeing groups come together that really just wouldn't talk before. I, I, I'm seeing, the, you know, the sharing of ideas. And I think that ultimately it's going to help our planet. Um, you know, we, we all have starting to see this environmental aspect and we can debate it all we want. But even if, you know, let's just say global warming isn't a real thing, right? Uh, I'm not saying it is or isn't, but let's just take that off off the table. Wouldn't it be better just to have more use of the same stuff that we have, like water, right, um, and clean air and food just to go around um, for places? And it's not, you know, it, we, we already had an episode with um, um, a group and we talked about, you know, food and ripening and, and we learned that. 40% of all food harvested is just thrown out. I mean, that's too much. No. That's, that's too much. I mean, 40%, I mean, would you take 40% of your paycheck and throw it out? Heck no, uh, I wouldn't. Not even for revenge spending. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no. Yeah. So I think that, that, that there are some, you know, good things that are, that are 
that are coming out of that. Um, there's also the advancements we've seen with innovation and technology. Um, I still think that there's a lot of work to do there. I remember four years ago, everyone talking about blockchain is going to change the world. And I think it is going to change the world. I think it was there was a lot of overstatements. I think it is going to help the world. I think it is going to make things better, but it's not a be all end all. It's still blockchain is a component to many solutions that are in there. What's the information that's going to be on the chain, right? And how can we leverage things that we've already used? Like, how can I leverage to already take information that I have in my environment related to my goods and services and products and put it in there in a fashion where everyone understands what it is, right? And, and everyone can extend it above and beyond. And so now looking forward, it's, okay, here's all the food that I have. Who could use it? Who's close? Who's far away? You know, the stuff that isn't ready to ripen, I'm going to ship that the furthest. The stuff that is ripened, I'm going to keep that local. Um, and how can I still play in this web of, of uh, events and, and doing things? So are you ready for me to get standards geeky? Sure. Sure. <laughs> He's not. So when you just said all that, it reminds me and anybody who's who I've chatted with, I have this passion for the use of standards because what that use case that Reed was just talking about and the ability to know what product you have, how fresh it is. If you use the, the GS1 standards, but standards, then everybody up and down that supply chain can understand the language that you're speaking. So if you have a product identity, you know, you have a G10, a global trade item number, um, a GLN, where that where that thing is, a global location number, then you're able to make those decisions very quickly and share that information, whether it's in a blockchain or whether it's through EDI or whether it's through GDSN, that's more product data, but also the importance of getting back to that really um that that building block having really good product master data is like the foundation of all of this because without good product master data then none of this supply chain is going to be successful i will now get off of my um standards <laughs> standards uh podium now but it's I'm just gonna like, to all of it i'm going to stay on that for just one point and we were talking last week with we were, I was at a conference um, for e-commerce um, and just talking about, you know, different aspects of e-commerce and, and things that are going on and supply chain and direct to consumer and, and, and all of these other things. And this person got up and started speaking. And they're like, it's, I don't know why we refer to it as e-commerce. It's just commerce. That's where we are today. Whether, you know, because I was out with the kids this weekend for their sports events and somebody had a pop-up tent and, and they're selling their goods. And of course, one of the kids wanted a t-shirt and I didn't have my wallet on me. And the person said, you have your phone, right? And I said, yes, we take Apple Pay, you know, and they took my credit card, boom, right then and there. So if that's not e-commerce or real commerce or physical commerce, it, we, we all need it. Um, and then they, of course, they ran out of things that were super, you know, popular. So the point is, is that it's if you start in e-commerce and you're starting direct to consumer or if you're starting in retail, physical and your historical big name brands and you're changing over, there's nuances, but there's fundamentals as well. And it's all interrelated, whether you get it shipped directly to your store, to your house, which back in the day when, you know, you know me, I just rode the horses to school, you know, type of thing, <laughs> uphill both ways. Perfect. But in all seriousness, it was catalogs. We had catalogs. We had JCPenney catalogs, we had Sears catalog, we had Macy's catalog, LL Bean catalog. I mean, that's how we did all of our Christmas shopping. You yeah, know, you circled the pages. The yeah, back in the day, right? And then you had circulars that were done for your local stores and different things. But fundamentally, it's still the same stuff. So when I hear people say, oh, well, we do D to C. So, you know, you know, it's just going direct to the consumer. I'm like it is. But you don't have clear visibility because that manufacturer might have it at three different distribution centers or five. Or you're doing so well now Target or CVS or Walgreens or 
some other popular brand, you know, retailers asked you to carry your brand in your store, well, you're going to need to go to that physical world, right? So it's, it's just commerce. I thought that was the biggest takeaway I got from it. And it was, you know, we're all evolving. Um, we're evolving differently and fast. And I think that the internet has really helped us move through. Like, I think technology has helped us move through the environments we're in. I mean, think about it. We wouldn't be able to have this conversation um, like we're having right now if it was 1980. Um, you know, if we all were sent home, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we had to do. So most of us were sent home, but we still maintained the work um, and, and completed it. So I think that there's a lot of silver lines. I don't think everything is super scary. Um, <laughs> back to the supply chain you, you brought up earlier that maybe we're three quarters of the way through this. I don't, I don't know how far we're through this, but I think that we have learned a lot in the last 18 months as a globe. Yes. Um, and I think all vendors are leaning in saying, hey, I'll help you if you can help me, as we all do, right? It's just as human beings, I think fundamentally we're here to help one another. I really do. Um, it's part of our survival. I think it's just instinctive, right? But I think that we're still going to have some some of these um, bottlenecks, you know, like we're seeing in L.A. I think it was like three weeks ago it was – 40 ships and now we're up to like 90 or a hundred ships sitting off the port of LA trying to get in. And, you know, I know we had one of our guests talk about, you know, the, the docks and the port being able to run 24 seven and they got the unions and everyone involved, you know, um, to, to agree to that. But then they didn't have the truck drivers. They didn't have the, the, the quantity of truck drivers they needed because guess what? Those truck drivers were pulled in by other places to do other things. And, um, you know, it, it, it's so it's compounded bottlenecking. I think that we're still going to have to deal with that through a few more quarters. Um, yeah. It just, you know, there's no. It's way almost like it. it was a perfect storm to get here. It's going to have to be a perfect storm to get out of it. It's going to take time and a lot of different, you know, pieces to fall into place. Yeah, and like any storm, there's always cleanup, right? It's yeah. not like oh, the storm's over. Let's go outside you know, we're going to have to clean up and patch up things and, you know, fix some roofs and cut down trees and clean up some stuff and repair things. And I think that's where we're at right now. Uh, and I think that that's what we're, we're going through. Yep. Yep. No. So what, are, what, what do we think the, the, the three big takeaways are from this, from this conversation from, from you and I here? Let's see. Um, I really think that, the supply chain conversations, um, we've always had the supply chain. I just think we're all more aware of what the supply chains are and how they impact us from a day-to-day -day, um, perspective. And you touched on, you can't be efficient um, if you don't have resiliency. And those have been two huge buzzwords for you know 2020 and 2021. And I think it's going to continue uh, into the future. So yeah. that's one. I agree. I agree. I think another one is just the communication, the transparency, you know, more data available. Not not this is what my order is, but where can I get this order filled from and who within my web of supply folks can help me out and and how can I share? So, you know, we all have to have those contractual one up, one downs in the supply chain that we're all aware of. But I think that there's more data out there that can be shared that's not being shared and just communicating more often and, and early, which brings to your point of geeking out a little bit on- I mean, uh, standards can help, right? Like, so if, no you're, doubt. if you're speaking the same language and you start identifying and capturing and sharing that information the same way with your um, trading partners, you're gonna get the that efficiency and improve your resiliency at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really do believe, you know, just taking that universal product code just really helps to know that I'm getting what I asked for and it's coming from, you know, maybe a different source this time, but I still know it's the same product. It's not a version of the product I wanted. It's the same product. Yeah. So having that universal product code definitely yeah. helps. Well, this was cool Liz. um, I, you know, scary, but I think that there's definitely a <laughs> silver lining out there for all of us and 
We can't go backwards. We can only go forwards. Absolutely. Absolutely. It'll, it's not all bad, but no. we're here. We'll, it'll, it's it'll not all bad. Out. Yep. Yeah, we are here. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you for joining the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1US. If you enjoyed today's show, you can subscribe to our feed or explore more great episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to share and follow us on social media. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.